I am, uh, I'm going to give a presentation here today on Scala Z Stream, um, the good parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about the not so good parts, but mostly I'll gloss over those today. Um, as I think uh, Colt mentioned, I am using Represent, which is a really nice tool actually for doing presentations, except for graphics. <laughs> um, so who am I? I'm, I'm Derek Chenbecker. Um, I've been doing Scala development since about 2007. I uh, did a lot of work with Lyft uh, initially. Um, moved on to some actual commercial work um, for a couple different companies. Uh, at my current job at Simple Energy, we use Scala Z Stream uh, for uh, data processing and energy usage um, from utility companies. We've been using Scala Z Stream for about a year. Um, my friends either wince or give me a blank stare when I say it, but I like to think of myself as a pragmatically functional programmer. Right? So, the, I, see, I see the benefit in some of the things, other things, you know, you have to convince me a little more. Um, we've already had a couple talks today on Scala Z, which is great. Hopefully, um, everybody's at least a little bit up to speed on what this is. So I'm not going to really touch on Scala Z directly. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is primarily Scala Z stream. We won't touch on, on much that's related to Scala Z and in, in all. Um, what is Scala Z Stream? Scala Z Stream, as the name kind of implies, is a stream processing library built on Scala Z uh, foundations. Um, it's a compositional library for, for stream data processing. And what that means is, I mean, at its core, Scala Z Stream is a really simple library, right? I mean, a stream of data is something that produces data, something that transforms that data, and something that consumes that data. But um, Scala Z Stream provides a, a nice breadth of different pieces for those things that allow you to work with them and plug different things together in different ways uh, in a really simple fashion. Um, there's also a, a big part of Scala Z Stream that's uh, built around resource um, safety and around uh, constraints on resources. So resource safety is making sure that you know, like you're not leasing, leaving file handles open, you're not you know, trashing your VM in the process of dealing with things. And the constraints allow you to do things like process two terabytes of data without having to worry about your heap blowing or blowing stack or any of that kind of stuff. Um, a big goal is performance. Um, there are some areas where Scala Z Stream, you're going to trade a little bit of functionality for performance. But in general, in our experience, it's been, it's been pretty good. It's been a reasonable balance between the two. Um, what I talk about here, the examples I give are using Scala Z Stream 07A uh, and Scala Z 7.1. Um, there were some pretty significant bugs uh, in concurrency. Yeah, no, Dan, <laughs> I like to be a little understated. Dan, Daniel will kind of go off the rails if we, if we dive too much into what was fixed. But uh, just in general, if you can, try and use the latest version because there's some pretty big, big things that were fixed there. Um, for this talk, we're going to use this set of imports. I'm going to go ahead and bring those in here. Um, basically, uh, you know, I think. Colt, Colt said, you know, you can either kind of be surgical about what you want to bring in from Scala Z, or you can bring in, you know, the kitchen sink. And for conciseness here, I'm just going to bring, bring in everything, right? So we're using Scala Z, uh, Scala Z Stream, bring in all the stuff from there. Scala Z Concurrent Task is the Mona that I'll be working in. Generally, on the work that I do, that's all we work in is Task. Um, it has a lot, a lot of nice functionality uh, that was already touched on in Colt's talk and, and in uh, Stu's talk related to how some of that stuff is used for cats. Um, but I'll show some more things that we can do with it here for Scala Z Stream. And then I'm bringing in some duration stuff because part of Scala Z Stream is some time-based uh, streams of data, which are kind of neat to work with, and I want to show those off. So what is a process? So the process is kind of the core concept or the core type of Scala Z Stream. And a process is basically a sequence of values, or more specifically, it is a description of a sequence of operations to produce values. Right? So what I've got here is a pint. I'm not going to call it a pint because I don't believe in Hungarian notation. We, we have a pint here that is just a process operating in task over a whole bunch of integers. Right? Process emit all is just going to do what it says. It's going to take that sequence and emit each of those elements in the sequence. Now, if I run this, you kind of get to see some of the sausage being made. Um, when I say that it's a description of a sequence of operations, there's a you know, this is, this is an interpreted kind of thing. So you have this construct that is a process, and then when you need to do something with it, you need to turn that description into something that actually runs and interprets that and produces things, does the things you want it to do. So here we, you can see the, the actual return value is an emit of list of this stuff. And so that's basically saying emit these things. 
Um, there's emit, there's also emit all. Uh, process eval lets you take an effectful um, operation and produce values from that. So, you know, here I've got a silly little sleep for a second, but you could envision, say, reading from a file or a socket or anything like that. Eval lets you say, I'm going to do something within my, within my monad, and that's going to produce a value and, and just deal with it that way. Anything that is not, that is, in, uh, you know, like the emit and emit alls are, are evaluated directly. So we can run these, and we see more of these things. One other thing I want to point out here, um, for the, the process eval, what we get here is an await, right? And so you can see there the await is a little bit more of this machinery where it's saying, we're going, to we're going to execute this thing. And then you'll see there's a function one, right? So processes, um, there's a sequence of values. You can concatenate them together. Uh, you can put them together. This is essentially like a thunking process. So this is like this function is going to be executed to produce the rest of the tail, essentially. Um, repetition is something uh, that's pretty easy. You can do a repeat eval if you have something that is an effectful operation. Um, you can also do uh, a dot repeat on the end of any process, essentially, and that turns that process into something that repeats ad infinitum. Um, there's also constant, right? So constant is kind of the, the uh, analog to repeat eval for things that aren't effectful. So you could just say process, process constant 42. I'm going to just produce a whole bunch of 42s. As of 0.7, uh, rep2 is not actually equivalent to rep1. Rep2 will, will hang sometimes, um, depending on what you're doing the task. This is what I said about Daniel knowing all the ins and outs and the bugs. But yeah, that's, that's a good point. Is, uh, generally, you would want to use repeat eval. Repe repeat is something more like if you were past a process, um, you could use repeat to, to essentially go over that again and again. But yeah, if, if you're constructing it, you should use repeat eval because that's more, more in line with what you want to do. We're making it work. It's good work. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. So, so we've shown a little bit of how we get data into a process or how we construct a process, but then you really want to do something with the process, right? So, um, the first thing uh, that you do is you need to run that process. Um, running the process does not actually execute the process. It constructs the machinery that will execute the process. So in this case, it's going to return, uh, if you have a process of F, that is the monad is working in F, run will give you back an F that does the things the process is supposed to do. Um, here I'm working a task, so I get back a task. If I actually run run, this is, this is where things get a little silly, I think, in terms of syntax, but you run you run run a, you run, run a process, and that... The first run says, OK, take the description of the process, turn that into a task that's going to do something. The second run is actually executing the task. Now, if you remember, pint is just a process of a whole bunch of ints. So I ran it, and I got nothing, right? Well, that's actually to be expected, because remember, a process to do anything either has to be an effectful operation, or you'd have to consume that process. And so when I said run this, I said, OK, make this process generate some values, but don't do anything <coughs> with them. So that's why I got nothing back. There are a couple variants on the process.run that let you do other things with them. So run last um, takes the process and executes it, returning whatever the last value produced was from the process. And in this case, so it returns an option, and that's because it's po processes don't always have to produce values. There are processes that are essentially process of nothing, so they don't produce anything. And so uh, you can get a none there. Um, the other thing you can do is a run log. This is um, run log is one of those things where. Sorry. Go ahead. So is run dot uh, last an effectful thing, or is that? So run run last is. Wait, how do you how do you mean is that deterministic? Right. So. You call it again. Yeah, it'll it'll do the same thing. Depends on your underlying monad. Right. right yeah. Run, that's run yeah. Last, run last. Will do that. Run last is deterministic. It's just run last dot. Well, it's deterministic if you didn't do something like a merge at, upstream from it, right? I mean, as long as you're deterministic on the process that you're, cons that you're running. Right, but that's, that's encapsulated in your effect. So, right. So run last itself, the value from run last is effectively transparent. Yes. But the value from run on the task is Yes, not. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, and that would encapsulate the merge upstream. Right, right. So run log uh, is something that basically um, executes the process and collects the values that it produces. Right, so it returns it here as a vector. So we, we had a process that emits one, two, three, four. We go ahead and run log that. We get a vector back out for those. Um, if you're doing anything of size 
uh, with this run log is a really bad idea. I mean, obviously it's collecting all the values. So, you know, like we process 10 gigs of XML a day uh, at work. If I were to do a run log on that, I'd probably get fired after someone came and had a very stern talking to me because we'd blow heap and do all kinds of other nasty things. So run log is nice if you know that you have a, well, a fairly small thing or if you just want to debug something or, or kind of log things. But um, there are other ways to, to uh, deal with processes we'll get to later. Run fold map is kind of like the, the last run method on processes. And run fold map is kind of an interesting one. Um, I actually like it a lot because you, there are some things you can do really easily with it. Um, Essentially, it's, it's kind of like fold map on, uh, in Scala Z where you're taking a mapping function and then you're folding over the results of that mapping. It's map reduce, right? I think that's how it was described. Um, so for example here, I've got, my, I've got my process of integers. I just want to sum, sum all of them up, right? So I just I instantiate a monoid here um, that says I'm going to add all the things together and my identity is zero. And when I do a run fold map on that, first of all, I'm not trying to transform the value, so I just use identity here. But I get back the sum of those. So 1, 2, 3, 4 is 10. So is, um, is run log just run fold map with decimal Yeah. 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 I think, is, is that how it's implemented? I can't remember him. Yeah, everything except for run is implemented through run fold map. So run last, for example. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Run fold map, yeah. Which actually is a source of some bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so processes are rerunnable, right? So it's just a description. So if you execute it as long as the same state exists, then you're getting the same results. So I can run this as many times as I want. I'm going to always get that back. Um, if you're dealing with external state, like if you're probably doing anything I.O. related or in this case doing something really bad and defining some vars to mutate, um, you will get different results every time, right? So this, what this is doing, this is, this is basically just, uh, it's a conditional on what that var actually value is. And so, um, yeah, don't, don't do this. Gen generally, you don't want to mutate things outside of your control if, if you don't have to. But that's, that's a general Scala thing. That's not, that's not specific to Scala Z stream. Um, process relies on the stack safety of the monad that you're operating in. Right, so there's there's nothing magic about process. It has to operate based on what the monad can provide. Um, if the monad doesn't trampoline, uh, you can blow your stack. Um, if you, even if you're using task, uh, task is not guaranteed. So task often will uh, work in a different thread, um, depending on what you're doing. But there are cases where it's not running in a different thread, and so it's very easy to to blow your stack that way if you're not careful. Um, if you don't have any effects at all, like you have a, a process, uh, it's like a process zero, I think is what it is. You, there are some methods applicable to it, like two stream, two list, two, two vector, stuff like that, where you basically can just produce the values, and that runs it for you. So the, almost all of the stack blowing stuff has been fixed. Um, <laughs> but the uh, run, like run fold map, run log, et cetera, like that's, you'll, you'll blow your stack in that. Okay. And all of the process zero stuff that you just referenced, right. those are not stack safe. Right now, yeah. Process, process zero, don't use it if you know that you, that you need something that's stack safe. Yeah. It, that's more like if you had a process emit all, right? That's not actually operating in something that needs stack, so you could, you could do that. But. Um, in general, methods that are available on, on Seek and, and its ilk in the standard library are available. You have things like map, filter, flat map, zip, take, all those kinds of things. Um, if you actually look at the library, not all of them are actually implemented on process. In fact, I think most of them are not implemented on process. They're actually implemented in another construct that I'll be covering towards the end that's a little more advanced way to deal with processes. Um, but yeah, we can, we can run all of these. We get, we get our plus tens. We get whether, you know, we filter on, on the Fibonacci numbers that are divisible by two. Um, fairly straightforward. Um, plus plus and append. Uh, are basically what they say. You can append two processes together, and when you execute that, you'll get the concatenation of those processes. Now, it only works if the previous processes were successful, right? So here I have an emit all. I'm going to emit a couple numbers. Then I'm going to issue a fail, and a fail is basically a terminating process. It's saying this process is halting specifically for this exception reason. There's also a process halt, which is kind of your normal uh, 
termination condition. And then I'm going to try and emit a zero after that. But um, as you can see here, uh, I only got the first five numbers because as soon as we hit the fail, it terminated things. Now, another thing to notice here, I'm working in task which has attempt run on it. You see, instead of doing run run, I do an attempt run. And an attempt run basically executes the task, and if an exception is thrown, it's, it's returned as, as a disjunction, right? So either the throwable on the left or the actual return value on the right. And in this case, down here, you can see at the bottom, we got a left of, of the exception that I expected. So given that you need to be able to handle exceptions or other things happening, there are a couple of uh, methods that you can use. Um, one is on complete. This is kind of like your finally clause in your code. Um, if, you, if you have an on complete at the end of a process, no matter how that process terminates, you will execute that code. There are some corner cases. There are some known bugs. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Daniel's rolling his eyes here. There's some, there's some bugs. In theory, on complete should always run the way you expect it to do, as would a finally clause. But there are a couple of outstanding bugs that if you're doing some not so friendly things with, uh, with mapping and nesting things, you can screw things up. But generally, on complete is like your finally. There's on failure, which is kind of like a recovery, right? So on failure takes a function from throwable to process. And so you can, you know, if you just wanted to say log the error, you could log it there and you could, you could just return a process halt. Or you could recover from it and do something else and return more process to, to produce. Um, on kill is, is another one like that. On kill is like, there's, there's a way to essentially kill a process, which basically says just halt what you're doing, absolutely stop, and on kill handles that. So we talked a little bit before about how like, the methods on seek are available on, on a process. You have, you have map, flat maps, like that. Well, um, it's nice to be able to work uh, with a transformation on a process in the context, a context of a process. And the, the type for this is called a channel. And a channel, I mean, like it says, is something that you run data through and you transform it. And what a channel really is, is a process that produces a mapping function over and over and over again. And what happens behind the scenes is that mapping function is applied to each element as it comes through. So here I've got a simple channel. Um, channel task in int basically says that I'm working in task. My input type is an int. My output type is an int. Uh, and process.constant, if you remember, is basically just repeatedly produce this value. Um, the signature for the function you have to produce has to go from an A to an F of B. Right, so it's an effectful transformation, and that's why this is in this task now. Uh, task now is essentially just immediately evaluate this, um, because presumably addition is not going to have any side effects. Not in my JVM. I, I don't feel like I should have to qualify that, but um, I'm sorry. Let me run that. So, so I get a channel there. Now it's it's interesting. Channel is actually just a type alias. If you look at the source, channel is just a process of f of a to b, a to, a to f of b. You know, so these are all kind of interchangeable. But fortunately, uh, there's some nice type, type aliases that make it clear that that's what you're trying to do with this. Um, so working with a channel, if you take an existing process, you can you can transform it through a channel by using the through method, right? So I'm taking my pint and I'm going to add two to everything here. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a run log so I see what my results are. And took one, two, three, four, five, and got three, four, five, six. You can also transform a channel. So given a channel, you can contramap the input. And that is to say, if you, expe if you expect an A for that channel, you can take a, something from C to A and apply that as a, like a pre-mapping function. Or you can map out, which maps the output to something else. So given a B to a C, you can, go, you can get a channel from an A to a C. Um, similar to channels, sinks are the consumption side of processes. And again, this is really just a process that's producing functions. In this case, it is a um, process from that with, a, with a function from A to F of unit. Right? It, the whole point of a sink is to be an effectful consumption of the value. And so the return type is unit. You know, because it's a process, you could do a through on this. You would just get back units which doesn't make much sense, right? So, um, but what you normally do is uh, you will use the to method on your process. So you say process to and your sync, and when you run that, you get, you get your effects, right? So here I'm not doing run log. Here I'm doing run because now I actually have something that will consume the values with the to, 
right? So when I run this, it'll actually consume what those values were, right? So this is my transformed function. Additionally, you can observe things. And this is a really nice, this is a really nice feature in this, right? So essentially you're splitting off, it's like you're kind of forking the outputs as they come through. I mean, that's not really how it's implemented, but essentially what you get is with an observe, your sync gets a copy of the value as it goes through, but you also still get the value as it comes through. So in this case, if I did a run log, I actually get my consumption that prints the standard out on lines, and I also get the, the return value at the end. And so this is something where if you had, say, a process that was producing values and you had a couple different things that wanted to work with those values, you could just observe off to those various sinks, and they just kind of split off and do their thing, and then you could have a final consumption at the end. It's also super useful for debugging. Like yeah, it's built yes. This huge pipeline of processes that goes through this, that goes through that, through that. You can just stick and observe any point in there to print line and see what the heck is being passed through. Like, yep. Yeah. Best thing ever. Yeah. Uh, whatever. I mean, it's, that's the thing. It's like that's one of the things I love about Scholars at Stream. It's like such a simple co concept, but it has all these really nice, simple tools that make a very powerful abstraction for working with big data. Um, concurrency within processes. So, essentially, when you run a process you're going to execute it sequentially. Um, if you have a bunch of processes that all produce the same values, you can do what's called a merge. Right? So merge n takes a number of input processes. They all have to be the same type. I, I, you can't merge strings and ints together and expect to get something normal out of that. <laughs> um, although you could, if you, had, if you had a case like that, you know, like that might be something where you pre-map to a disjunction. right? So you could use a disjunction as, as really as an either, as opposed to like an error handling type. You could say, okay, it's either going to be a string or an int, and you can pipe that in and merge those at that point. But you'd have to do a little work ahead of time. Um, the merge is non-deterministic. Uh, it means that when, when you execute it, it's going to pick from those processes as it goes, but it, you're not necessarily guaranteed any order there. Um, merge n also takes a max parallelism count. And this is kind of an important thing. If you don't specify a parameter for max parallelism, you're basically saying you're unbounded on on the merge. You can do whatever you want. You can take up as much memory as you want. You can use as many threads as you want. In production, that's usually a bad thing. Uh, you want to constrain things. Um, so you know, typically what we do uh, at Simple Energy is we will usually bound to some factor of the number of cores. We tend to be more heavily CPU bound than memory bound, but you may use something else there as a, as a heuristic for, for bounding that. But in general, although Scala Z Stream does provide a couple different things that are generally unbounded, you want to use the bounded version uh, where you can. Avoid yourself some future grief and, uh, you know, like 3 a.m. calls on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, so here I just took, I took my pint and I run it through, I run it through a merge. You can see I'm, I'm flat mapping, or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not flat mapping. I'm mapping each of the values to its own process, and the process simply prints out what th which thread it was run on and what the value was. And you can see here that it's, it's non-deterministic. That was kind of funny. I don't know if it's going to do it again. Yeah. So like... I don't know if this is cache warm up or what's going on, but like after the first run, it seems it, it would appear to be deterministic, but don't be fooled. <laughs> so error handling patterns. I talked before about how, you know, you can you could kind of have this global error handling at your monad level, right? So if you're using task, you could kind of do an attempt or an attempt run there, and you could say, okay, well, the process exploded at some point and I got an exception out of it. But that's not that satisfying if you deal with a lot of data. I mean you don't know where it died. You don't know what, what happened exactly. Um, on a per element basis, it's very typical to use disjunctions. And this is where you could basically say, I have something that I'm going to do. Uh, here I'm going to give you an example of parsing integers, right? So I've taken a whole bunch of strings. I'm going to try and parse integers from them. I'm going to get, I'm actually going to get validations out of this because parseint is a, is a validation implicit. Um, and I just disjunction that. I left map the actual error that I get to just like fail this, because otherwise it's a, a number format exception, I think. Um, but when I get this, you can see, let me go ahead and just run log this. So I get a whole bunch of lefts and rights. I get three rights for the successful parses, and I get a left for the, the one that failed, because foo is not a number in Arabic. I don't know, it could be in a different one. Yeah? Um, I think earlier you Yes, you could. OK, so how do you decide between doing that and having a constant channel? Um, I would typically use a channel. This, this is more just kind of demo code thrown together. Um, yeah, generally in production, like 
I'll write a channel specifically to do a, a certain task because then it just fits in more naturally because when you're looking at what a process is doing, you'll see it's through this channel, through this channel, rather than looking at, I mean, a whole bunch of maps is going to be much more verbose if you, if you have any non-trivial operation on your processes. All this eval stuff, right? Or you know, reading stuff from threads, or reading stuff from variables, or network stuff. Like you could do that in a channel. So you have a channel that you know pipes this data through some other machine and then comes back. You can't do that. Anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing to remember there is that a, a channel's the the signature of the function that you're that a channel's built on is an a to an f of b, right? So in that f, you can do all kinds of effectful things. Whereas with just a plain map, you can't do that, right? Um, you would end up with a process of tasks or whatever, which wouldn't make much sense. So the channel can, can do its own explicit threading, or do not do It does not. It does not, no. No. Uh, that's, that's incumbent on whatever monad you're using to determine what's, what's happening in terms of threading. So you can unjoin that? Hmm? You can unjoin back the process. Like, let's say you do map and you get this, this task, that, like A to B and B is like a task of, of C. Yeah. You can. Oh yeah. No, there's 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 nothing preventing you from doing something like if you end like if you took a process of ints and you turn that into say a process of a process of like task of HTTP response or something, there's nothing that would prevent you at the end from say doing like a run fold map and folding over the tasks and executing them there. But the machinery is kind of geared towards. But you can also like the, there is also a dot eval that you can use on on a process right. like that to kind of join it up and, and flatten it yeah. if you want to. But I mean, the, the machinery, as you said, is very much. Yeah, like you, you could do an eval map identity. Yeah. And basically, I mean, or, or you, can, you can just do an eval map, really. That's the other way to do it, would be an eval map. Let's you take essentially the same function signature and use that yeah. not, not in a channel. Yeah, there is, there is a flatten map process. Yeah. And, and yeah, you can do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So back to the error handling, you know, when you're working with a disjunction, there's actually, you know, there's actually a type for this. There are type alias. So a writer of task of W of O is really just a process of task of W disjunction O, right? So you, you've taken a disjunction and now you're dealing with it in, in a way that's kind of designed for this. And the nice thing is there are a whole bunch of, of methods on a writer uh, through syntax that give you things like map W or observe O or, you know, strip W. So you can do things like I've got a process of disjunctions. Maybe I only want to do certain things to the error sides, or I want to only do things to the, the valid sides, right? And so you can do that. So like strip, base, uh, strip W would basically say, run through this process, and wherever I have an error side to this junction, throw that away, and anything that is, is the success side or the O side, be, it becomes a process of O at that point. So you're like throwing away the disjunctionality I don't know if that's the word, but you're throwing away the disjunctitude. I, I'm, oh I'm falling apart. Um, but so, writer, is, is that assuming there's like a zero for O? o? Like this is o. not, yeah, so this is, could, might be a little confusing. This is not the same writer. This, oh, is, okay. this is like strictly a type alias. Yeah, writer, writer in this case is a process. Yes, it's a process. Oh, I so, sure. yeah. I Yeah, so this, this is just something that allows you to say, I have, I have two cases for every element. I have something that was maybe a success, something that was a failure, whatever, and I want to specifically apply things to one side or the other, right? So example here, so I, I have my parsed process, which gave us three valid parsed integers and one bad one. If I do a drain W here, um, that basically says anything that is a, a, right, a W side, an error side in this case, I want to... <laughs> Uh, drain to this sink. And IO standard outlines is basically a pre-made sink that says, you know, like for every element, take that string and, and ship it to standard out. You'll see here, because I did a run log, I get back a vector of collected values. The collected values are the ones on, on the O side, right? So um, drain W is something that we use all the time. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll parse XML data, right? So like there could be something wrong with this particular XML stanza. That becomes something that we drain W off to this error reporting. You know, further down the line, maybe we need to do some calculations. Something was wrong here. You know, the ones that make it through on the O side, the ones that aren't on the W side, we send those off to a different sink. And so you can kind of work through your different phases of your processing that way. 
So real world usage, um, there are, you know, unless you have a really boring job, you're probably not gonna be using emit and emit all all that often, or at least not for the bulk of your work. I mean, if, if you're getting paid money to, to spit out a whole bunch of integers, I, I need to talk to you. Um, <laughs> because that sounds like a dream job. Um, but you know, typically you're going to be wor working with effectful things. You're going to be working with I.O. You're going to be working with files, network sockets. Um, you know, we use AMQP. We use RabbitMQ. We, we have process wrappers around that. We use Kafka. We have process wrappers around that. Um, there are a number of uh, really handy utilities in the Scala Stream I.O. package. Um, they're mostly geared around reading and writing from files or from standard and standard out or from input streams, right? Input streams and output streams. Um, they're kind of broken down by what they read, whether it's a byte vector. Byte vector comes from uh, Skodak, which I think Stu may have mentioned earlier, is an awesome library for dealing with binary data. Just really fantastic. Byte vector. I really suggest looking at Skodek. I, I think every person who comes up and presents should kind of push that today. <laughs> um, That's true. So, so I feel obligated to say that, but you know, you really should take a look at it. But even if you don't care, you don't, you know, want to know about it. Basically, you can think of byte vector as an array of bytes, right? Um, so you're dealing with byte vectors, which are binary data that you're chunking in and out of of something, or you're dealing with strings, which is typically going to be lines, like from standard in, standard out, whatever. Um, new in the 07 branch of uh, Scala Z stream is this really cool uh, function called to input stream. If you're dealing with any like non Scala Z libraries, which is not all that unlikely, um, and you need to get something from a process into this horrid Java library you need to deal with, um, to input stream will basically take that process and turn it into a Java input stream that something else can read from as if it were an input stream. And all the magic is done behind the scenes uh, for you. You don't have to deal with that. I'm not going to cover all the individual methods for I.O., but I do want to cover one specific one, because this is a really nice one. It's very handy. Um, this is what we've used to write things like adapters for AMQP and, and uh, Kafka, things like that. Um, I.O. resource is basically a method that takes three functions. There's a function for allocation, which basically says, whatever my process is going to read from or consume from, I'm going to set it up here. I'm going to set that up. There's a cleanup that allows you to do resource deallocation at the end. And then there's actually essentially an iterative processing function that says, you know, given what the current state of this thing is, do something else to produce another value or stop the process and then keep going. And so um, it's a very trivial, like, seven-line example, but you can, you can extrapolate this. I think we're going to open source some of our uh, AMQP and Kafka stuff, so we'll have something to actually look at there. Um, How often do you, do you find yourself doing the cl throw cluster in a loop? Only in IO resource. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, that is like the one ugly thing about this. It's terrible. Yeah. That's it's, the whole reason that repeated val isn't the same as invalid. Repeated. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you see here, this is, I hadn't gotten to this yet, but yeah. So the meat of my function here, I've basically created an iterator. And I just need to say, if I have another value in the iterator, go ahead and produce that. Otherwise, Throw an exception, which is really <laughs> awful, really, really awful. But this is how you terminate a process from the inside, right? From the outside, you can just say, like, I only want to take this many values, or I only need to produce this many values, and that'll kind of halt it normally. But if you're actually inside kind of the guts of the, of the evaluation system, this is how you stop things. So the, yeah, the, the good news is that that's actually only inside the guts of, like, the sinks and channel stuff. Right? Yeah. Because resource is creating, a, I think, a, a channel does it create? I don't remember. Yeah. Um, or there's like a channel under the surface. But it, if you're inside of a normal process, you have a little bit more control and you don't have to use exceptions. Yeah, no, no, no. Like you can always yeah. flat map into a halt or, or uh, no, not flat map. You can eval map into something that produces. No, you flat map into a halt. Oh, yeah, you flat map into a halt. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, we're trying to do it. Yeah. So IO resource, love it, hate it. It's, it's really useful, but yeah, this is like the one word on it. Um, but yeah, so if, if I go ahead and um, run log this. So I get my done executed first. Remember, the cleanup happens at the end of the process evaluation, but the actual finishing the collecting of values happens even after that. Right? So that's, that's why I get the done before I actually get the values out. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly. I, I mentioned at the beginning uh, there's some time-based uh, processes you can use. These are kind of cool. 
they, they may or may not be useful to them, but I think they're good to know about. There are a lot of little nooks and crannies of Scala's Ed Stream uh, in terms of functionality, and that's, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to cover the breadth of things. So I wanted to cover these. So first one is Awake Every. This, is, this one's actually really useful. This is basically a timer. Um, you run it, I'm gonna execute every second. It produces a continuous process, it won't halt. That's why I have the take three in here at the end there. So I'm saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take three values from this and then I'm gonna stop. If I didn't do that, it would be a very boring presentation from this point forward. Um, but you'll see here, one of the things you have to bring, if you're using these time-based, uh, the time-based process, you have to bring in a scheduler because that's what it uses behind the scenes to actually schedule the things to be produced. Um, sleep waits a specified dura duration before emitting a value. Now, it doesn't actually emit a value. Um, <laughs> so maybe that's a misleading title, but you know, sleep does actually sleep for the, that amount of time and then I have to, that's why I have to append another process to actually emit the value on the end of this. So I run this, I'm gonna get a sleep for one second, roughly two seconds, roughly three seconds. Um, you can see here, um, process is just like, it, uh, they, they do have, they are a monad, so you can, you can flat map, or uh, sorry, for comprehension on those. Um, duration is a continuous stream. Now, when I first got into Scala's Ed stream and I was trying to look through all the, the corners and everything, continuous streams kind of blew my mind at first. I was like, wait, it's continuous, like, it ha like, how can it be continuous, right? We have to do something to execute this. But really what's happening is the range is continuous, but the actual computation of that time is, is discrete, right? So you could use uh, duration gives you the duration from the initial uh, invocation of the process. So when the process started computing to where you are now is the duration that you get back. As a simple example here, we want to time how fast our print line Im implementation is. Um, so I can run that and I get uh, an interleave here. So my, you know, I actually get the print line and then I also have the two IO standard out lines so that I can actually see what the durations were and that tells me that it's probably fast enough. Um, every is another continuous Boolean stream which is true after some, uh, which is true basically after boundaries of duration, right? So it's a continuous stream of Booleans, but you can think of this as kind of like a, um, it's, it's a bit that gets flipped once every time it crosses this duration boundary. So in this case, uh, I want to run a, a, a timer every second, and I'm gonna zip that with an awake every quarter second. So I should get four values, but only one of every four should be true, right? And what happens is when you consume that true, the next value will be false again. It basically resets the value until the next time it crosses that time duration. Now, potential use case would be like checkpointing, like you're consuming off a stream, you wanna make sure that after some number of seconds you're gonna do some operation to, to push stuff off to the side. I'm gonna run this here and you can see, so we get true, false, 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 true. So getting more into the uh, asynchronous side of things, there's a, a Scala's Ed Stream async package uh, that has a couple of these um, nice constructs for uh, dealing with asynchronous things. Um, outside of processes. The first is queues. Um, there, like I said at the beginning, there are two versions of queues. There are unbounded and bounded. I recommend the bounded. Um, <laughs> you can live dangerously. Um, Yellow queue. Right, yeah, so a, a queue, I mean, a queue is a queue. The, the, the difference here is when you construct a queue, the queue itself is not the process, but the queue that you construct has methods that allow you to create producer syncs and consumer processes that you can run from, right? So here I've got, I'm gonna go ahead and push two values into my queue. So I'm creating a queue with, with size two. My queue.nq gives me a sync. So I can, I can sync values into that and that's basically pushing things onto the end of the queue. I'm gonna do a run async when I execute the task because I don't, obviously if I block that, it's not gonna ever get to the DQ part of it. Um, but then my queue, DQ gives you a process of the values coming off the end of the queue. So that gives you something you consume. Now, if you, you can have more than one consumer, you can have more than one producer, and it'll do the right thing in terms of interleaving. It's non-deterministic which ones are gonna get off. I can't remember what the, if there's fairness. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there, there's a lot of fairness built into Y, and there's, a, there's some fairness built into merge N, and so if you actually are using those to the, the two processes that are pulling things off as fast as possible, yeah. then yes, there is fairness. Okay. But, um, not, not, in, you're, not you're, inherent to Q itself. It's more, more what the process is that is, is producing and consuming values. So if you're only uh, like adding one amount of time in the sink, it's going to do Q semantics? It's, 
Yeah, it'll 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 block. I, I think the actual implementation is non-blocking. Uh, yeah, the implementation is non-blocking, so it's not just wrapping array blocking queue. Right. It is. Right. Um, it will asynchronously block. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, but yeah, if if you could you could you know tie a process to queue and queue and just shove a whole bunch of stuff in, but it's going to essentially stop as soon as the queue fills until you attach consumers to the end of it on the DQ side. Yeah. That makes sense. It is it is important to note that if you have like if you're trying to do like multiple consumers on the same queue, um, I mean like like Derek said, they're not gonna get the same data. You're also as of master, um, they're not even guaranteed necessarily to have strict ordering. Like the ordering will basically work, but we can only guarantee ordering if you decide to if you allow us to throw data away. Which is not necessarily what you want, <laughs> or or ever what you want, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that that, that I mean the, the, the recovery stuff causes problems. Right. So go ahead and run the queue. I get I get my four, my two forty twos back out on the consumer. Uh, remember to close things down. <laughs> um, there 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 are a whole bunch of things where you're building these kinds of things where there are shutdowns, uh, especially with like queues and topics, which I'm going to talk about next. These are things that are like not themselves processes, but they do have things behind the scenes that are doing things, and so you need to cleanly shut them down. A topic is like a queue, except consumers receive all messages. It's pretty basic. It's like pub sub for processes. Um, one thing to note, is, and similar to other pub sub architectures, is that when you subscribe to a topic, you're only going to get messages essentially from that point forward. Um, there is queuing actually involved inside uh, because if a, if a consumer gets behind on things, you need to be able to buffer up the values they haven't consumed yet. And so I think Daniel pointed this out when we were talking earlier. There is a possibility there that you could, you could blow up your resources that way. Yeah, the, the queues inside of topics are unbounded. Yeah. So uh, perhaps not for production use. Yeah. Okay, I think that answers my question. If you had a topic and one slow consumer, it's not going to stop the one producer pushing onto the topic. No. Your machine will die. Yeah, your, your heap will stop you okay. eventually. <laughs> um, with, with queues, though, it will. Yeah, with, with queues, it will. Queues, it will. Topics, it won't currently. Um, there's also signals. So signals are another one of these. Um, this is, they're available in both discrete and continuous variants. But basically, a signal is kind of like a, it's, it's a signal. You can set values. Uh, and consumers of the signal get notified when the value changes or when the value is set. Um, in this case, I'm just going to do a really simple uh, Boolean signal. So I say async signal of false. And you see, it actually prints out the Rx false. So I, had a, I have a discrete signal. I'm mapping it into a string version of that, and I'm sending that to, to standard out for the consumer. Because there is initial value set, I get the initial value when I pull that off, right? So it, this is not like topics where you only get things from when you subscribe forward. It's like you will get the current value, I think, and then value changes going forward. Value changes going forward, um, there's, you can basically, um, there's a set method that lets you um, essentially do an F of whatever a task uh, and run that. Interestingly, it's not, the signal doesn't get, or the consumer doesn't get notified when the value changes, it's whenever the value is set. I, I was surprised when I saw this behavior, actually. I thought that it should be when the value changes, but then you have to, you, yeah, you would have to have an equal. You would have to know, like, then Scala's at stream would have to be aware of what it is that it's actually signaling on, which then I kind of understood why it is the way it is. Um, there is network support. Um, TCP and UDP, I think there's still some bugs in the TCP, so I'm not sure that that's ready for prime time, but I can, I can fire up a UDP listener here. Um, and this is just like a, pro a process, just like anything else. Listen is going to open a socket and then receives, uh, gives me a buffer size. I'm going to take some number of packets off that and do something with them. So I'm going to use my handy netcat here and fire off some test packets. And you can see that I get these down here. And because I did take three, I actually get to continue. Um, if you're going to do network-related stuff, I would really recommend looking at Scala's at Netty. Um, this is a, it's a really nice wrapper around the Netty library with all process-based stuff. I think it's NIO1, yeah. Um, and the TCP stuff uses NIO2 and does not work. Um, it, uh, it also, NIO2 does not work um, on certain platforms. Like, you know, there's actually like bugs in, in the Mac OS X kernel that you can run into with TCP stuff like that. So U UDP, though, is pretty solid. And yeah. it's NIO1. 
Yeah, so if you need an echo server or, you know, you're set. <laughs> um, so if you have a job where you're building echo servers, I kind of want to talk to you. It's, that sounds almost it's the same company as the ints. Yeah. Job. Yeah, right. Yeah, All right, so we've, we've talked about a couple ways to do transformations, but everything that we've talked about so far has kind of been stateless transformations. Like if you have map or you have a channel, you don't have any way of kind of looking back at what it was that the previous values were or anything like that. But there are some really useful things you want to be able to do with there. Um, so we can build these with a, another part of Scala's string called process one. Process one is basically a process that takes a single input, produces a single output. You can use it to build tail recursive like transformations. And I say like because remember that when we construct processes, we're chaining together thunks. We're chaining together essentially functions that will give us whatever the next value is when we need it, right? So it's not, tail, it's not actually tail recursion, but it'll look a lot like it. Um, this is something that we use at Simple Energy. Like I said, we ingest a lot of data. We want to get statistics and some other stuff on the data that's flowing through the stream. And so we wanted a way to be able to say, OK, given all the stuff running through here, kind of classify what the values are and, and gather that into some statistics, stuff that can be reported when we need it. And that way we kind of do heuristics. We can say, OK, we have way too many failures, you know, low number of successes, all that kind of stuff. So first, we need a monoid to collect our stats in. Um, and because it's the easy way to do things, I'm going to use a disjunction to count failures and successes. Um, just to make the code a little easier to read, I will actually use a case class for the collector um, and for the monoid here. So I got those set up. We're going to classify with an accumulator here. So I've, I've created a, a method here, go. And it looks like a tail recursive function, but I'm not going to use that tail rec, right? But what I'm, the first thing I do is I call process receive one or. And what process receive one or does is it waits for a single input to come in. And if an input does not come in because the, process, the upstream process has terminated, I get this or clause that I get to execute. And for right now, I'm filling it in with question marks. Next slide will show what we're going to do there. But essentially, at the end of a process, we will do something there on the or side of things. Um, for the actual, uh, for the second function, uh, that's an argument to receive one or this is the actual processing thing. This is saying given a value that came in from the upstream process, I'm going to do something with it. And what I'm doing is first thing I need to do is actually emit it because I want to kind of observe statistics on what's going on. I don't want to actually change what happened in the stream. Um, but then I just append that to the next invocation of Go along with a, uh, a semi-group append of whatever the current accumulator is of my stream's case class along with a fold. Um, the fold is a method on this junction that basically you can say, if you have an A and a B, you get two methods. One gets applied if it's an A. One function gets applied if it's a B. And so uh, because my left side is an error, uh, I want to produce a stream stats 0, 1, because 1 was failures on the, on the, in the stream stats class. If, if it's a right side, I want stream stats 1, 0. And that's basically going to, the, the append there, the pipe plus pipe, I'm not even going to try and name these things, um, is going to basically sum those things up, sum those case classes up as they come through. So to expand that a little bit then, um, now I've got my full report stats. And you can see the basic meat of my, my go method is in there. But, and then I just basically kick things off with a go m0 um, that says, you know, I'm going to start not by cooking the books. I'm going to start with zero counts for everything and go from there. That. And the way that you use that, they're, um, like everything else in Scala Z, there is a symbolic name and a normal English name. Um, here, for conciseness, I just used its pipe greater than is basically saying, given the parsed pipe, pipe that through this process one called report stats. And all I'm doing here for my collector function is I'm saying I'm just going to print whatever the, the collected statistics were. And then I can run this. And I get back stream stats that said I had three successes, one failure. And then my, you can ver verify that by looking at the output of run log. So we, we use this on really big streams. And you know, like I said at the beginning, the, the really nice thing about Scala Z stream, it is designed around constraining the resources that you're using at any given time. And this is one of those things where you can do some work with really big data sets and not have to worry so much about you know, like, how is this all going to fit. Uh, no, you couldn't do this with observe because observe uh, doesn't have any way to pass the accumulator, right? So observe, observe you can use to basically say within this 
particular process stream, I can kind of look at what the values are. That's why it's observed, but you can't really do anything with them other than report them. So, so you, can't, you can't observe and then take the, you know, it's not like you can't actually split the process so that you're observing here and doing something else here. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, totally forgot. One last plug here. Scala Z Netty, I already plugged. Should definitely take a look at that if you're doing network stuff. If you're doing stuff HTTP related, HTTP for S is a really, really nice project uh, for kind of a lightweight REST layer uh, HTTP service that uses processes in Scala Z stream for input and output. So, thanks. <laughs>